North Eye is a deserted medieval village in East Sussex, a settlement abandoned in the Middle Ages. Once forming part of an archipelago on the southeast coast, the island has since been reclaimed and is part of an area of marshland called Pevensey Levels. Scheduled under the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act 1979 and a named Ramsar site, which is the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, North Eye has experienced significant change since documentation of the site began in the 700s. Storms, salt mines, the Black Death and smuggling have shaped the physical geography and socio-economic history of the site, the remnants of which are made visible by a series of shallow trenches in the ground. This landscape is defined by its shape-shifting nature. Natural and human forces have created a transient marshland where details are revealed and concealed over time through dynamic water levels and documenting a chronological history is challenging. This research engages with methods for documenting physically shifting landscapes and looks to drawing as a way of revealing narratives perhaps less visible through a lens. I'm interested in how illustration might document alternative time frames and readings of place, those that shift, overlap and converge, defying a linear narrative structure. Using archival research, location drawing and fieldwork methods, I have traced lines in the landscape, collecting material from above, below and ground level at North Eye in an attempt to reclaim fragile transient stories stories that have been submerged or buried or evaporated. John Berger describes the challenges in recording a story sequentially unfolding in time. He suggests that instead of being aware of a point as an infinitely small part of a straight line, we are aware of it as an infinitely small part of an infinite number of lines, as the centre of a star of lines. And this seems like an appropriate metaphor for North Eye, a landscape built on a complex network of lines, from agricultural drainage systems to a phantom grid layout of the deserted village. I wanted to, catch, I wanted to use the word trace as a method for finding these lines in an attempt to capture the temporal qualities of the marsh. Tracing is transient by its definition, to trace is to provide an indication of the existence or passing of something, an apt approach to documenting a site that is inherently inconclusive. As a 2000 geoarchaeological report carried out by Oxford Archaeology describes, only the earthworks within Chapel Field are well preserved. The rest of the surrounding works have been reduced by ploughing to amorphous banks and ditches. It is not known when the port of Northside ceased to exist. The nature and properties of these lines vary considerably. Some are deep and permanent, others fleeting and superficial. All carry a thread of North Eye's unfolding story. Tim Ingold describes lines as three different processes. An additive line, one that has been laid on top of an existing surface. A reductive line, carved, etched or engraved to create a negative impression. And a self-created line, one that is caused by the rupturing or splitting of material. I will present a body of research that explores these ideas and draws together key pieces of primary and secondary research that examine the role of drawing as a narrative device for inhabiting territory between past and present readings of the site. Early on in my research to uncover and document lines in the landscape, I make contact with Julian Porter, curator at Bexhill Museum. The museum specialises in natural history and ethnography and has a collection of artefacts uncovered from a 1952 dig of Northside Chapel, although the report itself was mysteriously lost. It's convenient. Um, a flint head and ox shoe lie alongside other dark, rust-coloured fragments in a glass vitrine. Underneath a large piece of cairn stone, possibly from a chapel that once stood on North Eye, sits on a square of beige carpet on the wooden floorboards. Despite the loss of the excavation report, Julian tells me that they have a significant amount of material in the back office that isn't on display. 
He says that not many people ask about Northside, and because they're a small museum, it's hard to find the time and resources to digitise and catalogue everything. I offered to bring in my Canon A4 flatbed and laptop to scan the material for him. A week later, sifting through dusty boxes and files piled high on the red veneer table in the education room, I come across a collection of maps, an elaborate system of lines attempting to piece together the story of the deserted medieval village. The marks of an office of blue biro, careful, deliberate and precise, sit alongside broken graphite dashes following the gradual reshaping of the coastline over centuries. Invented legends and speculative annotations, the result of hours and days of investigation and painstaking research, hungry for a story to unfold. The reappropriation of the maps through tracing, photocopying, redrawing and scanning created strata similar to the geology of the earth itself, making visible the layers of historic narrative present in this landscape. The first recording of the site was documented in a 772 King Offer Charter of Becks Hill. A meeting of pathways across the landscape is described as the five ways in the original perambulations. In traditional English law, perambulations were used to determine the bounds of a legal area by walking a line around it and recording the route in writing, as the following extract describes. South to the valley, up along the Little Heath Field to the Goblin Well, south to Sillen Mount, from the Mount to the Sillen Well, west along the stream to Thuna's Lair, along the Western Stream, abutting the Salt Marsh to the Five Ways, north along the Moor to the Place of Slaughter and the Northern Foul Water Ford, up the Old Dyke, east along the Dyke, and thus to the Moss Well. The five ways are now marked by a cluster of footpath association badges on a livestock gate, tourist yellow cutting through the marshes. In late June, I join a public walk to North Eye run by the museum. As we make our way, a group of 20, through the overgrown grass in search of the lost village, lines thread out behind us until we reach an anonymous rise in the marsh. The landscape is green-brown, faded by the sun, and cracks appear in the dry earth. Fragments of chalk and limestone emerge from sunken crevices, the result of hasty paths constructed by farmers, and looking closely at the ground unearths narratives from the past. The 2009 Geoarchaeological Report presents the results of a series of borehole transects collected from North Eye. Vertical soil strata diagrams, dense with marks and lines to describe a coded colour, run through the PDF to reveal the deserted village's geological story. Silt, clay and peat deposits evidence the shifting landscape and the gradual reclamation of Northside, alongside traces of salt workings that suggest the village's industrial significance. Low-rising mounds line the edges of North Eye, a chain of salt deposits indicating the once prosperous site. As we gather around Julian, our guide, on the highest point of the reclaimed island where the chapel of St James once stood, the earthworks become more visible as wide, empty shallows, although the best way to see them is on Google Earth. The chapel fell into ruin after the village was deserted in 1400. An anonymous painting found in 1986 depicts a dilapidated building with an exposed ribcage roof lying in a tumultuous sea of fields. The title reads North High Chapel, perhaps. By 1859, the ruins have disappeared, but parch marks are noted by a local resident. The lines caused by thinner crop growth over solid features such as masonry show up in aerial photographs as outlines of pre-existing structures. They are examples of iconography, a term translated historically as a marking of the building's weight delving into the virgin earth. In the 1960s, North Eye was used as a commercial turf growing site and the deserted village was repeatedly ploughed before being scheduled under the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act. An annotation on one of the maps from Bexhill Museum reads, Rod Sargent has seen stones here when area being ploughed for turfing. 
a century before this, North Eye ruins described as a power of stones in the Sussex Archaeological Society volumes, a power being the well-known Sussex expression for a considerable quantity or number of stones. These stones were then taken and reused by local people, and it's believed that recovered material from the ruins of the chapel now lie under a nearby road as hardcore. The carcasses of commercial turfing machinery still line the trade, an old track that leads the North Eye to present day. I think back to the ox shoe fragment in the glass vitrine at Bexhill Museum and the historic ploughing that would have taken place at North Eye, oxen slicing through the earth. This area held some of the most valuable agricultural land in the country and the marshes have since existed as grazing for sheep and cattle. Earlier on in the year, I visit the site and see quad bike mark tracks snaking across the landscape. It's lambing season and the lattice of lines illustrate an agricultural clock, a farmer at work at the busiest time of the year checking and counting livestock. I recently had the opportunity to observe this agricultural clock firsthand. Danny, a cattle farmer and landowner of North Eye, has 250 cows and spends four mornings a week counting his animals on a round trip across Who and Pevensey. Sitting in his Land Rover with T, the Jack Russell, on my lap, we drive down the original trade route that connected North Eye to Barnhorn. We follow the cattle paths across the marsh and arrive at the first herd, a large group of heifers. Danny asks me to count and says it would be easier if I stand on top of the Land Rover to get to a higher vantage point. I climb up and look down, counting 74. He says that there are only 60 in the herd. So I failed quite badly. Um, after walking amongst the animals to get a closer look and check for any signs of illness, Danny pulls out a small notebook from his pocket. It's filled with lines of data recordings, he calls it his office, tracking the cycle of each animal from birth to death. Another sheet of paper is presented with different coloured columns to classify different herds and record any changes in the group. It's a simple but rigorous system, relying on the old practice of lookering, where a farmer or shepherd follows old paths across the landscape to count and monitor livestock. There used to be looker huts dotted across the marsh, used by herdsmen to shelter from the exposed landscape whilst driving livestock. These have all but disappeared, with only one looker cottage still standing at Rockhouse Bank, which was previously South Eye Island. The lone house stands on top of the former island, breaking the horizon line. The remoteness of the area allowed darker practices to thrive, and these shelters formed part of smuggling runs that ghosted across the marsh. The need for local knowledge and contacts meant that this was prime smugglers' territory, where contraband from the coast crossed by routes only known to locals, and the practice of owling, the illegal exports of wool, thrived in the surrounding area. On the way back, we stopped by another farmer, Roger, who grazes his sheep on Danny's land in the winter when the cows have to go in so that the land isn't torn up in the wet months between October to March. Roger's house sits on high ground above the levels and he lets me go behind the farm buildings to look at the views across the marshes. Watery contrails streak the sky above swathes of flat land which run uninterrupted until colliding with the South Downs to the west. When the sea mist comes in and low-lying ground is obscured, the islands apparently appear as they once were, as eyes, eye being the historic suffix for island, rising up over the landscape and punctuating the otherwise flat horizon line. Mist, rain, storms and ice, weather transforms this landscape. Once existing as an inland sea dotted with islands, water-based processes write and rewrite the story of North Eye. Throughout the 13th century, a series of bad storms tear through the levels, with one account from 1250 describing it as the moon turning red and the tide flowing twice without ebbing. In 1755, the Lisbon earthquake transforms the levels once again, 
Starting in the Atlantic, it creates a tsunami wave taking four hours to reach the coast of England. The effects of the tsunami increase as the seabed becomes shallower, so by the time it hits low-lying areas, like the marshland, uh, tidal areas become choked with beach and make the water's force visible. Tree stumps smashed by the storms were dredged at a local farm by the pill beams several years ago. The fragments now decorate their garden lawn as ornaments, gradually disintegrating in the open air, disappearing time. Short violent episodes have changed the appearance of the marshes irrevocably alongside slower and less dramatic variations in the landscape. In the winter season, water collects in the irregularities in North Eye's surface, turning Chapel Field into a series of reflective scars. Using several cuts of oak, modelled into water measuring devices by Richard, a local woodsman, I wade into the middle of these temporary pools to collect level readings from October to February. Richard joins me on a trip in December, and we negotiate the torn surface of the gateway that leads to the main footpath. Deep holes left behind by cattle, put away for the winter ahead, have filled with water, frozen over, and the river, Wallace Haven, is high after rainfall, relying on the nearby pumping station to regulate levels. We arrive at Chapel Field and begin measuring the water height of several round shallows on the highest ground. I ask Richard what he thinks the indentations are, and he suggests dew ponds, also called mist and cloud ponds. This ancient technology is more complex than it first appears. Used on high ground, where the land is quickly drained, they provide a source of water to livestock. After hollowing out earth, they supposedly fill with precipitated dew, but the process is obscure. An article in Country Life 2006 claims that Aristotle, in fact, first posed the question, does dew rise from the soil by evaporation or precipitates by condensation from the air? Less evocative investigations by UNEP in 1982, however, conclude that they are in fact filled with rainwater. Either way, at the end of my experiment, I'm left with several readings per shallow marked off of my water level measures. They are impermanent images, traces of time unfolding over the winter months. These gentler fluctuations in the landscape contribute to the rhythm of North Eye's ongoing narrative. Long periods of deep, slow shifting change shattered by cataclysmic events, altering a way of life and changing the anticipated history of a place. Not only is the linear unfolding of North Eye's documented, not only is the linear unfolding of North Eye's documented history fragmented, but its story seems to rely just as heavily on what we don't know as much as what we do. Lost report, reports, ploughed ruins, inconclusive data and anonymous paintings, the seemingly simple task of tracing lines becomes a forensic study, weaving in and out of time, objects, space and people. The threads of North High's story become knotted and untied. It's as though the landscape doesn't want to be concluded, resisting traditional storylines where beginnings, middles and endings become obsolete. Instead, horizontal and vertical narratives run through North High, intersecting like Berger's star, a web of traces that appear, disappear and reappear. Some exist for thousands of years, others for a minute. The residue of the past collides with the present while stories are laid for the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.